So, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on the last technical meeting of 2020. This feels like it, 2020 is super quick in some senses, and for others, I know it's been a bit of a challenging year, but certainly we have soldier. So today's event, um, let's say, is our last in season. So we're looking at game changing offshore renewable energy projects. So slightly different from some of our more traditional type talks that feature oil and gas. So this one will be and they're covering their presentations over the next half hour or so. We'll try and keep them to time and then we'll have questions and discussion at the end as per normal. Any Questions you have for them as you're going through, as you go through presentations, pop them in the chat function and then we can, or the QA function, and we'll pick them up at the end. So, our first event uh, presenter this morning is Simon Cheeseman, who is the Wave and Tidal Energy Sector Specialist at the ORE Catapult. So, I'm going to hand over you to you, Simon. You have 10 minutes or so, not the 10 minutes or so. And yep. uh, over to you, Simon, for your first presentation of the morning. Okay, thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, can you just nod if you can hear me clearly? Yeah, good, because the uh, the sound keeps uh, dropping in and out a little bit at my end. But um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, this uh, webinar. Uh, as Rebecca says, my name's Simon Cheeseman. I work for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, over the period of this, uh, I've got 10 minutes to talk to you. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Catapult is and what we do in the offshore renewables energy um, uh, market. Um, and then I'll um, I'll sort of provide a few links into um, the follow on speakers as well. So Hugh Riddle from our organization and also um, to Arc Marine and Tom Burbeck. So here's a little bit about me. So my background is um, really sort of uh, electrical electronic engineering and then going into um, program management, both in the public and private sector. Um, I got into renewables probably about just over 10 years ago now. I used to work for an organization called the Energy Technologies Institute, which was in Loughborough. And um, that was a sort of public private partnership looking at um, with, with some of the big sort of renewable and um, oil and gas companies looking at sort of early stage renewables. Um, since then, I've been working for the offshore renewable energy catapult. I'm their um, wave and tidal sector specialist. But I also do a lot of work now in um, floating offshore winds, specifically focused down in the in the Celtic Sea off the coast of Cornwall. So let's have a quick look at um, the catapult itself. So um, headquarters in Glasgow, and then we've got our main sort of test assets in Blythe. And what we're really about is trying to drive down the cost of offshore renewable energy. So our sort of um, our, our, our our sort of model is a, a model of collaboration with both um, academia and industry, looking at new innovation and looking at ways to drive down the cost for offshore renewables. That's both um, fixed bottom and floating offshore wind, wave and tidal energy. And increasingly, we now start to look at sort of energy storage, and within energy storage, we're looking at sort of um, batteries as well as hydrogen um, as a new energy vector. Um, so wherever there's a, a sort of region that's got a strong interest in renewables, we um, we um, then sort of have regional offices in those areas. So in Hull, we've now got one in Lowestoft. I'm down here, down in the southwest in Cornwall. We've got a large office in Wales. We've got a colleague, Hugh, who's based up here in Aberdeen with a lot of you. Uh, and then we've got our own offshore wind turbine at um, Levermouth that we provide as, a, um, as an open site uh, test facility for um, industry to test sort of widgets and things like that. So trying to explain what the catapult does in, an, in one slide is quite challenging. So uh, apologies if this is a bit busy, but effectively we're looking across the whole of this sort of um, development, technology development um, pathway. Um, and so, you know, we do sort of get involved in sort of basic principles and sort of technology concepts. We do a lot of um, technology assessment for new ideas that are, that are coming up. I suppose from a testing perspective, we tend to come in here about the, the middle range here um, for validating sort of technology. So our facilities in Blythe, um, we do blade testing. So we can test blades now um, that are in excess of 100 meters in length. And we're doing sort of structural as well as sort of fatigue tests on those. 
Um, we can do um, cable tests, um, so bending of um, subsea cables. Um, they can either be um, inert or they can be powered up. They can be in the dry or they can be in the wet. Um, this is a sort of bird's eye view of our electrical lab, our high voltage lab, where we can sort of um, simulate very high voltages there, um, lightning strikes. We do a lot of work on um, electrical components, obviously. Then we've got a suite of um, docks. One's got an artificial seabed. Um, and so, in effect, anything that goes offshore, we can test it um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of relatively safe, benign area um, to make sure it functions as expected. Um, um, and so, we do a lot of um, sort of subsea infrastructure testing as well. And increasingly now, we're looking at autonomous systems for both um, sort of asset surveillance um, as well as sort of data collection as well. Um, in the tidal sphere, we do a lot of work with the tidal energy developers and also wave developers. Um, obviously, our core business, I suppose, is um, in offshore wind and increasingly looking at sort of operations and maintenance. Um, those are the sort of areas where we work very closely with the supply chain. And I'm going to leave Hugh to sort of talk about our um, some of our work there. Um, but we also look at some of the, the futuristic stuff. So the section I work in is sort of... Um, research and disrupt, disruptive innovation. Um, so we're looking at the future and even sort of um, airborne um, turbines uh, of the future. So we cover a, um, a really wide gambit of, um, of activity. Um, our doors always open to new technology ideas. We're working with both um, SMEs, so you know, very small SMEs, as well as the large OEMs and offshore operators. OK, so let's get on to um, more of the meat of the presentation then, and talk about really offshore wind. Um, so, you know, there's no doubt that um, with the advent of, you know, the recognition of climate change, um, the, the sort of dawn of net zero targets um, that um, and, you know, you would have seen. Offshore wind um, strike prices drop dramatically through the contracts for difference process. That the government runs, which is an auction system for um, energy subsidy. But we've got quite a healthy um, um, scope of um, offshore wind at the moment. Um, and you would have seen, or you may have seen yesterday, that um, Boris Johnson confirmed his, um, his policy pledge about increasing the amount of uh, energy we need in the future. So what originally was 30 gigawatts by 2030 has now become 40 gigawatts of renewables by 2030 and the original targets for 2050 that were 50 gigawatts um, the climate change committee have now said that that really should be 75 gigawatts so um, we're really pushing hard now for the deployment of flooding offshore um, of offshore wind um, in the in the uk so you know what does our energy system look like in the future this is what it sort of really looks like at the moment um, some fairly familiar numbers there, sort of dominated sort of by gas, uh, with nuclear as our sort of backbone. Um, but increasingly, winds, both onshore and offshore, starting to make a real impression um, there. Um, into the future, though, we expect there to be a much more, um, a much larger uh, wind component there, um, still with nuclear um, providing that backbone and a certain amount of sort of bioenergy and hydro and a limited amount of, of gas by then. Um, and so what are we doing in terms of the powering that electric revolution that's required? Um, and I suppose I've, I've sort of adopted what we call a sort of three phase approach to this. So in offshore wind, you know, we've, we've got these, um, you know, really challenging targets now um, of 75 gigawatts by 2050. Um, we're expecting that to be able to be met um, not only by um, floating offshore wind, where we see a lot of that obviously in the North Sea and then on the West Coast around sort of um, uh, Wales and um, Liverpool, um, but also then increasingly through floating offshore wind and I'll cover floating offshore wind um, uh, in, in a moment. But, um, you know, what we've got at the moment now is a, is, a, is a sort of stable policy framework now from the government, which is great and indications that the market, not only the UK, um, but Europe and the rest of the world is going to grow at a phenomenal rate. So all the right um, signs for economic growth, all the right signs for developing a, a new um, supply chain. 
and the government signed a set to deal with the offshore wind industry um, a while ago. And part of that deal was to raise the UK content uh, within um, offshore wind. At the moment, we're probably around sort of 20 to 30% UK content for North Sea um, offshore wind. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the designs are coming in from Germany and Denmark. And we're sort of, you know, trying to scrape a living through the operations and maintenance support of those installations. Um, in the future, we want to see a much bigger UK content. And um, the government have indicated that, um, you know, developers supply chain plans, um, they'll be holding their feet to the fire that where they make commitments to include UK content, they actually deliver on that. And we're working with suppliers to make sure that um, the UK supply chain can actually step up to the mark, um, understands that the offshore wind procurement processes operates to the right standards, and so can bid into those, those future sort of market opportunities. But the key thing is, you know, we've got a really dynamic supply chain here in the UK. Um, you know, we cover all parts of the spectrum. Um, and we've got um, some really great activity going on, albeit some of it's tucked away uh, in small industrial estates. Um, and we've got to sort of identify that and we look at sort of um, cross sector transition of technology as well. Um, and that's where we work with companies like Arc Marine, and you'll, you'll hear from Tom Burbert later um, with some of the technology that they're looking at, which is applicable across a number of um, subsea engineering offshore renewables um, uh, applications. So, you know, companies like Tom's really exciting organizations to work with and through the catapult, we're able to give them a springboard um, and give them the opportunities to get in front of some of the technology developers that on their own, they just wouldn't be able to get us sort of looking. Another key factor for us is um, what we call the Energy Transition Alliance. You may have read about this in the press. And this is um, uh, a formation between ourselves and the Oil and Gas Technology Center. And what we're effectively looking at is the sort of electrification of um, the oil and gas sector um, and focused on sort of net zero um, targets there. And, um, you know, we've got sort of funding for that now um, for a five year collaboration and a number of key projects that are kicking off. And um, most importantly, a sort of um, a technology roadmap that will be developed and will be made publicly available. Um, that have described what that um, transition um, will actually look like and um, the sort of timing um, for that. And there's a lot of work going on in terms of um, sort of different hub technologies and different sort of AC, DC technologies and things like that. So that's really exciting. Um, the third part that I'd like to talk about is um, floating wind and the catapults established a um, floating offshore wind centre of excellence. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, really, the vision here is to grab the opportunity, particularly for the UK. Um, so, the, the UK plays a much better part, a uh, greater part in floating offshore wind, um, particularly off the coast of Scotland and down in the Celtic Sea, down in the southwest. And um, we formed um, a group with these companies at the moment. There are more coming in. And effectively, you know, they pay a, um, a fee to be part of a group and that fee then goes towards um, projects that uh, we then run. And you would have seen um, recently a number of calls go out for opportunities here to provide support, looking at supply chain, um, looking at different sort of technology types. Um, and some of those um, potential projects are listed here. Um, and these are opportunities for supply chain companies to get involved and work with some of the leading developers for floating offshore wind. So a really exciting um, program there. So this is my last slide, just a summary slide, really. Um, but that's just sort of, you know, reminding you what I sort of covered and, and, and said. So, you know, there's no doubt our energy needs are increasing. And we face the, you know, some of the number of really tough challenges ahead. Um, you know, our thinking is that offshore wind with the costs of, of falling really dramatically um, and there's plenty of resource there to meet our needs. In fact, we can probably over stretch beyond the 2050 targets of 75 gigawatts with floating offshore wind. And that enables us to sort of look into hydrogen production as part of that sort of energy storage and grid balancing um, piece. So there's an opportunity here for the UK industry to get back in the game. Um, in terms of um, offshore wind, and we've got that right policy support, got the right market growth conditions for the supply chain to make a really big um, difference here. 
but it's all about energy integration and getting that grid balance right because you know there's certain issues around renewables with um, predictability and and so we've got to get that grid balance issue right with sort of energy storage and that sort of thing and i think the key message is you know to to, to companies out there is is don't sit back and just watch it happen is actually try and be a part of it and that's what we're offering through the offshore um, renewable energy catapult so that's my presentation. Thank you very much indeed for listening. And uh, there's question and answers at the, uh, the end of the presentation. So I'll hand back to Rebecca now. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Simon, for an interesting insight to the ORE. Um, let's see, yeah, anybody that's got any questions for Simon or the other speakers, uh, just pop them in the Q&A and we'll pick them up at the end. So moving swiftly on and keeping ourselves to time, I'm now going to pass it over to Hugh, also from the ORE Catapult, we will talk more about the supply chain opportunities. So over to you, Hugh. Yeah, thank you very much, Rebecca and Simon. It's always good to hear a colleague giving a presentation. You always learn something from uh, your <laughs> colleagues. Um, I would also say again, if you can see my slides, please nod. Although I can't see any uh, video at the moment, so I'll just yeah, have you on. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely excellent. So Simon's given an overview of ORE Catapult and what we actually do. I want to introduce you to some of the supply chain initiatives offered by ORE Catapult um, to companies in the north of Scotland. And this could be to companies who are already involved in offshore renewables or are looking to diversify. You know, some, some of the programs are applicable to, to some and not to others. So Simon's already set the scene actually for the potential growth in offshore wind. This one is a little bit more Scotland uh, specific. The map on the right shows the developments that are actually already producing electricity, plus a lot of the developments in offshore wind, a lot of the offshore wind farms that are either in construction or at the planning stage. What this doesn't show is actually the license blocks that are currently up for auction through the Scotland licensing programme which I believe the winners and losers will be announced um, late March, I think, next year. Um, the, the graph on the left is actually showing that, um, you know, currently there is less than one gigawatt installed off the coast of Scotland. Now, I think it was just two or three weeks ago, the Scottish Government updated their uh, target for 2030. Simon's already talked about UK targets and global targets for 2030. But in, the Scottish Government came up with a target of 11 gigawatts by 2030. So less than one gigawatt installed just now, 11 gigawatts installed by 2030. So that just gives an impression of just how much potential there is in this particular sector. So I'm going to talk about some of the supply chain programmes and opportunities. I'm not going to go into any great detail on any of these programmes. Um, these slides will be available to you afterwards. Plus, I would encourage you to either get in touch with myself or any of my colleagues or uh, search for more information on our websites because there's just so much information uh, that I can't give too much of a, an overview today. So some of the supply chain development programmes we have are Launch Academy, Fit for Offshore Renewables, and we're also managing the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. Launch Academy, that's a business accelerator programme, and that's targeting technology developers who are looking to support looking for support to take their technology just across that final hurdle towards commercialization. So that's a nine month program and it's delivered by ORE Catapult and a range of commercial partners. You know, there's commercialization support from IP, IP, legal, finance, technology and business strategy experts. So we utilize the likes of Barclays Bank uh, for the finance and Shepherd and Wedderburn for the legal aspects of that particular program. I believe we're just started the second cohort, and I think it's about nine or ten companies who are going on to that. Moving to the right hand side, we've got the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. So this was uh, formulated out of the offshore wind sector deal last year, 2019. So this is an industry funded supply chain program. It's managed by the ORE Catapult, and this particular program is targeting companies who are capable of significant growth in offshore wind. Um, the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership has a number of initiatives each year. There's currently a 2020 funding call that is open, and there's up to 1.5 million uh, potentially in funding for projects to help companies grow, improve their competitiveness, or in increase their capabilities. So this particular Offshore Wind Growth Partnership call is looking for companies with project proposals 
focused on investing in new equipment or increasing manufacturing, new operational processes, investing in disruptive technologies. Um, actually, last year we had a program of through the offshore wind growth partnership, and there was a local company, W3G Marine. Don't know if they're actually on the call, but they received some funding, for example, um, to uh, bring robotic welding into their process for manufacturing some uh, steel packets for their jacket stabilization tool, which has not reached the market yet, but they've received help. So they were being hand welded and now their robotic welding is going to be uh, they're going to be moving forward with that. Um, so that's the offshore wind growth partnership fit for offshore renewables, as it says there, it's to increase the competitive competitiveness, capacity and competence of UK offshore wind energy supply chain and to support continued cost reduction in offshore renewables, while simultaneously securing long term economic benefits to the UK. Um, so this is a business improvement programme, and that's aimed at supply chain companies who are looking to improve their readiness to bid for contracts in offshore wind. This is actually a 12 to 18 month programme, and it's aimed at companies who possess or developing cross sector or emerging technologies, which can be deployed in offshore wind. There are two phases uh, uh, to this programme. The first phase is business excellence. So that's establishing core business management capability and competence. Um, you go through a self-assessment there. There'll be an action plan drawn up with the help of an industrial assessor, and then there'll be some recommendations for uh, uh, improvements there. And phase two, that is actually sector specific. So this is relating to offshore wind. It's a blend of capacity building and sector specific assessments. Now, we've already held a pilot program in Scotland for up to, I think it was around about 20 companies. And I'm pleased to say actually that the vast majority of those companies were actually based in the northeast of Scotland and had an oil and gas uh, background and were looking to diversify. Many of those particular companies found the business excellence module pretty straightforward actually because they had the necessary procedures and practices already in place to satisfy clients in the stringent oil and gas sector. Um, but they obviously found the sector specific, which relating specifically to offshore wind, they found that extremely beneficial. And I think I've got the slide up at the moment for Balmoral. They were one of our first pilot companies and they actually achieved granted status in August 2020. And um, we're actually hoping to run another northeast of Scotland cohort in the new year. We're at the moment, can't say too much about it, but at the moment, we're trying to get some funding for that. We've started up another cohort in East Anglia very recently, and I think there are plans for one in northeast of England, but um, keep your eyes peeled on our website. Um, we'll also disseminate information through the likes of the clusters through Deepwind about a potential new cohort. Um, so we'll be looking for applications for that, hopefully uh, within the next few weeks or months. Simon has actually gone through um, a little bit of information about the Energy Transition Alliance, with, which is the collaboration between ORE Catapult and the OGTC um, to uh, meet net zero targets. Uh, I've named some of the, the projects there, some of which are led by ORE Catapult and, for example, Power From Shore and reducing the footprint of ACDC substations. That's actually led by the OGTC. Again, look at our website or get in touch if you're looking for more information on those particular projects. Although uh, for the Floating Wind Centre of Excellence, I can actually say that there are some current tender opportunities. I think Simon had listed some of these uh, particular uh, projects that we're working on, but these tenders were live, I think around about 6 p.m. on Tuesday. So there is time to have a to log on and uh, with on our portal and understand more about these particular projects, which are in areas specific to offshore uh, floating wind, moorings and anchoring systems, for example, and dynamic cables and ancillary equipment. So have a look at our website um, or get in touch if you want more details about those particular tender opportunities that are on the go at the moment. And I want to take you on to a project that's, uh, that I work very, very closely with. Many of you will be familiar with uh, Vattenfall's wind farm in Aberdeen Bay, which is officially named the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre, EOWDC. So 11 turbines there on jackets. There are only 200, uh, 200, 
2.5 kilometers from the beach. And um, these are still, at this very moment, they are the biggest and most powerful turbines at 8.8 .8 megawatts operating anywhere in the world. So this is officially a offshore wind demonstration wind farm. Um, we have a three-year collaboration agreement with Vattenfall, and that's for the demonstration of new technologies that could be on the turbines, on the seabed, for example. But we've got three-year collaboration agreement, and we've, uh, we're have working very, very closely with a lot of UK innovators so that they get this unique opportunity to demonstrate their technologies on one of the most advanced wind farms there is in the world, and it's a real-world environment. So the whole collaboration is about how to advance cost reduction and improve safety in offshore wind. Um, there are many motivations and benefits behind this collaboration agreement, but for SMEs, and maybe some listening today, you know, it, this is a, a fantastic opportunity for a technical demonstration in a representative commercial environment. It's a direct business development opportunity with Vattenfall. Um, We've had the go-ahead for a number of projects, unfortunately due to COVID-19 and restrictions on uh, numbers of people who can actually go offshore in the CTVs. We have been quite restricted in what we can go ahead with. But one local company, James Fisher AIS, who have their return to scene software for 360-degree imagery of uh, turbines, they've been very successful in the offshore oil and gas business doing 360-degree imagery of offshore platforms and FPSOs, for example. But they got the opportunity. Initially, they actually did it with our own turbine at Leaving Mouth, but they got the opportunity to um, do the 360-degree imagery for Vattenfall in Aberdeen Bay. And Vattenfall are absolutely delighted with that. And in fact, the company has won some work on the back of that. I think last week it was, they did the substation at Black Dog, and I believe that they've got the go-ahead to do some more work in one of the Vattenfall uh, wind farms. It's either in Denmark or, or Germany. I can't quite remember exactly where that one is. So, as I say, we've got the go-ahead for a number of projects, and they, they're, they're quite diverse projects, to be perfectly honest. You're ranging from cable monitoring to thunderstorm detection equipment. And we've also got another local company, uh, Survitech. They're providing their evacuator, emergency evacuation system, which um, we will be demonstrating hopefully in the next few weeks at EOWDC. And we've also, next speaker is Tom Burbeck of Arc Marine. We continue to have talks with uh, Vattenfall for the deployment of their 100% environmentally friendly reef tubes, but I don't want to talk too much about that because it's a fantastic technology and I'll be handing over to Tom to talk about that. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Hugh. Um, just before we hand over to Tom again, any questions for either Simon or Hugh, just pop them in the Q&A and I'll pick them up near the end. Um, and then I will now hand over to Tom from Arc Marine. I always say ARC Marine, but I'm now being corrected. So Arc Marine. So I'll hand over to you, Tom, and you can talk about your artificial reefs, which is an interesting concept and um, one that I do know quite a bit about um, of the various discussions we've had. So over to you. Perfect. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. If I can do the uh, the standard, if I can get a nod or a yes that everyone can see my screen, okay. Perfect. Right. So, um, hi, good uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this call. Uh, my name is Tom Burbeck. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Art Marine. Uh, my background is in commercial diving and aquaculture maintenance, so mainly the subsea inspection and installation of uh, shellfish lines uh, and inshore inshore civils inspections of pontoons, harbour walls, moorings, etc. Um, I'm here today, today to talk about uh, Art Marine, the exciting company uh, that. Simon and Hugh have both kindly alluded to. Uh, so ma we're mainly involved in the design and manufacturing of nature inclusive design. So we do that currently all in house uh, and we've got manufacturing bases in the southwest coast of England. Uh, one based in Truro in Cornwall, uh, the second one in Exeter, and we're currently looking up for a site uh, in Aberdeen. So we've also got mobile manufacturing capabilities so we can go anywhere in the world uh, and make reef cubes. Uh, depending on the size will warrant whether or not we manufacture in country uh, or ship our blocks um, from the UK. 
as well as uh, a hands-on approach to sort of making a nature inclusive design we also carry out ecological monitoring services so the pre and post uh, monitoring of ecosystems uh, as a commercial dive team we have a full team available to do that but we're also using more modern, modern techniques such as rovs bravs and edna we've got a really bi really big science team in art marine uh, who are very capable and they obviously offer scientific reporting that goes along with it so we've all seen uh, the brilliant, beautiful pictures of reef systems around the world, uh, and most recently, unfortunately, the bad. So reefs that have been destroyed due to damaging fishing practices, uh, disease and pollution. But what I'd like to talk about today is the ugly side of subsea protection. Uh, not a lot of people know that uh, during the 1970s uh, in the oil and gas era and telecommunications sort of boom, um, companies were deploying these sort of assets subsea to protect cables and pipelines and unbeknown really to them would be the hard job of trying to recover some of these products so because uh, they contain high co2 concrete toxic materials and often plastic as you can see by most of these examples here marine regulators deem them as marine litter so they have to be removed during the decommissioning process and to give you an idea on some of those numbers uh, there's approximately 80,000 concrete mattresses alone in the United Kingdom continental shelf. And a report from G and OG UK have highlighted it as a massive concern that needs to be addressed, primarily because of the, uh, the huge decommissioning cost that comes with it. So it's costing about £11,000 per map to recover, plus a landfill charge, which is circa £200 a tonne, each map weighing between eight and nine tonne. And it consumes just under four tons of diesel per mat during the recovery process using expensive DSV vessels. And this is a public issue as well as a industry issue because 50% of this decommissioning cost is picked up by the UK taxpayer in, uh, in tax breaks. So it's a, it's a massive problem that we need to find a solution to. And what we don't want to happen is the offshore renewable energy industry to sort of make that same mistake um, to, uh, that that's happened in the past. So for the past five years, we've been developing a range of technology to help solve these toxic materials. Uh, and at the basis of all our technology and products is our marine crete. And what we believe we can now do is replace the existing marine litter with a low CO2 and actually carbon neutral concrete, which is used with recycled materials and is completely eco-friendly. And what we think now is an opportunity for offshore developers is to have a positive marine legacy in every single project that, that they're a part of and actually now completely remove the decommissioning costs from their balance sheet, uh, which as you can see from the previous slides is, is a pretty hefty one at that. So directly trying to replace the materials I've mentioned, we've developed a marine mat uh, and we developed this with the industry in mind. So it's almost a complete replacement from a standard concrete mattress and is available in the standard sizing, but we can produce them in other sizes. It's currently achieving ex excellent strength, 50 to 60 megapascals, which exceeds some of the standards currently in place and we've also completely removed and made from any plastic component whatsoever and we're just starting to go down the certification route by DMBGL so this could be adopted by most industries. The picture you can see here on the bottom right is a scaled down version we deployed uh, in the southwest coast and as you can see there's a Balam Ras um, inhabiting the middle chamber and a, a European lobster underneath as well as tube worm coverage. That map was down less than six months. So it's really encouraging to see uh, the adhesion rates that we're seeing, but also the two species seen are, are key reef building species. So it was great to see that we're actually, we're building with nature here instead of against it. We've also developed reef cubes for use for scour protection, uh, rock berms and that type of thing. We're currently manufacturing from 250 millimeters weighing 15 kilos up to 1.5 meters that weigh just over five tons. And as such, they've got a sort of a range, a wide range of applications that aren't just for the energy industry. Um, they're also used in MPA protection, enforcement, ecotourism for divers, uh, as well as coastal defense. We're also working on some coral and mangrove plantation projects as well in tropical countries like Bahamas and Fiji's, which hopefully will mean we'll get some time out there. Um, just to give you a lowdown on some of the species, um, we've got tuna cuts on the left-hand side, edible crab, squid eggs, spider crabs, European lobster. These are just a, a snapshot of what we see. But what's really encouraging is that these could also be used to facilitate um, the, a boost in commercial fish stocks. There's often a bit of a conflict between the fishing community 
and offshore energy developers in fishing grounds. And what we would hope to do is actually prove nursery and spawning grounds around these sites. So although they might not be open to certain fishing practices, they could be open to passive fishing practices. And if the fishing community buys into the fact these are actually reefs that can help develop and produce um, more, more catch for them down the line, we, we could get a really good um, a really good relationship from marine spatial planning moving into the future. So you're probably thinking, well, how is your concrete eco-friendly if you're using Portland cement? So we've moved completely away from Portland cement altogether. We've developed our own mix. And we also use 98% uh, of our material is recycled uh, stone and sand from clay and quarry mining industries, which means that we've got a really low carbon footprint to begin with. And now we've started to integrate carbon capture materials into our mix. So reef cubes are now actually carbon neutral from the point of manufacture. And we have an LCA, a life cycle assessment that's going to be uh, carried out by the University of Exeter, which will prove these claims. So really exciting. We are um, selling reef cubes into pilot, pilot projects around the UK and throughout Europe. Um, we've had an extension on our uh, DEFRA and CFAS funded project, the Seafood Innovation Fund, which is deploying reef cubes around aquaculture sites. Uh, that's a really exciting project happening in the southwest coast. Um, we consider the technology around about the TRL6 touching TRL7 level. Uh, in terms of offshore wind, as you mentioned, we have had ongoing conversations with Vattenfall. COVID have put the brakes on that, as well as some license hurdles that we're just going to overcome. But I'm proud to say that we have just shipped our first international order to Holland last last month, um, and we've got a deployment happening for reef cubes around a substation, which I'll share the design with you later on. We're also in continuing dialogue with the Oil and Gas Technology Centre about potentially um, having the first deployment for oil and gas in Aberdeen, and we have some open dialogue with some developers there about projects in early 2021. So we should be submitting an application hopefully in December, January. Here's a snapshot of one of the offshore energy reefs that we're deploying to Holland. So this is not cable or pipeline protection. This is purely habitat enhancement, which is where we see the market going. There are regulations coming in in Holland to say that offshore energy developers must be sharing a net biodiversity gain when building the marine environment. And we think that's going to be coming to the UK. So these reefs have specifically been designed with ecologists from the rich North Sea to act as a breeding ground for nursery, breeding a nursery ground for sharks, rays, and cephalopods, so squid and octopus. So these will be going down hopefully at the end of the year. We've also been teaming up the University of Plymouth and the Marine uh, Business Technology Center to um, find a really low cost way of monitoring our reefs. So as well as the biological uh, uh, sort of side of things, we're looking at the bathymetry, bathymetry of the seabed. So multi-beam sonar imagery, to see exactly how the reef uh, develops over time and to, and to make sure it remains stable. Um, so we had a USV come out and map our reef fast project, um, the reef enhancement project down on the southwest coast around the aquaculture site. And so as part of the team, um, I mentioned myself, but we've also attracted some um, big players from the oil and gas industry, uh, Steve Wright and Colin Black, who are helping us break into the energy industry and um, with our technology developments. And we've also got 60% uh, of our team are made up of scientists. So marine biologists, marine scientists, uh, and oceanographers from universities, uh, from the University of Southampton and the University of Plymouth. So that's it from me. Um, we're keen to speak to anyone about potential projects where Reef Cubes or Art Marine could offer their services uh, and also partnerships. And as a SME, we're, we're also looking for investment. So back to you, Rebecca, and uh, we can answer some questions. Thank you, Tom, Simon, and Hugh, for your interesting uh, topics of conversation this morning. So I'm going to open up the uh, discussions whilst we see what q and come in, but certainly much for Simon. Um, I think we all know 2020 has been a challenging year for all of us, not just in business, but personally as well. Has that affected the strategy for the renewable sector? You know, I've been speaking to some people saying if they did a presentation in, say, February time, now that presentation thoughts are completely different. So have you seen that, that there's been a shift and a change because of the challenges we've had? Um, I think we had a we had a bit of a hiccup when when COVID first um, hit us and everyone went into lockdown. Um, a lot of offshore operations uh, were curtailed as a result of that. 
Um, and then when we did work out how to maintain sort of social distancing on vessels, when crews came ashore, there was no hotels for them. There was nowhere to eat. Um, so, so we had a bit of a lag until we worked out how to operate under those conditions. Um, I think, you know, now we're, we're back on, I'd, I'd say, you know, we're, we're, we've got our foot back hard on the accelerator. Um, and as you would have seen from the government's 10 point plan released yesterday, you know, s some things that were aspirational and were mentioned in the Tory manifesto are, are now being backed up um, with hard policy. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, we've had a um, uh, contracts for difference um, uh, conference uh, consultation um, that kicked off in March earlier this year. Um, and we're waiting for the results of that. We think that will move uh, fixed bottom offshore wind into a different pot. Um, that will enable floating offshore wind to substantiate. Um, so all, all the signs are very, very positive at the moment. Um, and what we're seeing is that, you know, around the rest of the world, um, you know, things are con con continuing. You know, there's a big push in um, France for um, offshore wind at the moment. Um, the United States, you know, you, you'd have seen Tom Biden talking about their sort of um, green renewables policy. And certainly in Asia, um, things are picking up and there again there. They came back online quite some time ago. So I, th I think it was a bit of a stummer. Um, but, um, you know, now we're, we're, we're hard at it again. Perfect. Thank you. Let's say yes. I know it's been challenging and a, a different way of working for lots of us and our businesses. So that does take me on to maybe Hugh. Um, obviously the supply chain. Um, and I don't know who the participants, but some some be, some SMEs might be on here or or certain comp uh, companies that work in oil and gas. So have you got any advice for companies that are maybe thinking about branching out into renewables? Because uh, we see it from the OGTC's point of view. We do see a lot of companies that have always been traditional oil and gas companies, service companies, or engineering companies, and say, "Well, I don't really know how to get into the renewables, and there's maybe some challenges associated with that." So, is there any advice that you'd have to some of these companies that are thinking about potentially branching yeah, out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's it's very much a daily occurrence for me. Um, I'm talking to companies every single day who are either at the very start of their journey or they've won a small order, but we really want to get better connected. So I'm talking to companies every single day who are looking to diversify into offshore renewables. I think that's primarily because uh, most of the companies I deal with are already in the oil and gas industry. And one thing that's absolutely certain in oil and gas is there's going to be another downturn around the corner. It used to be every seven years, but it just seems to be one downturn <laughs> after another at the moment. So they're obviously all looking to diversify. My main advice would be, yes, get in touch with people like ourselves, with myself or Simon, depends where you're geographically located. But um, through the sector deal last year, there was the establishment of eight um, regionalised clusters in offshore wind. So in Scotland, for example, we've got one called Deep Wind North of Scotland. So north of Scotland, it's a pet loose term, but deep wind, <laughs> it's called that because it's going to be not it's going to be quite a bit of focus on floating offshore wind, which Simon was mentioning earlier, because a lot of the Scotland license blocks that are up for auction at present are going to be in waters, I think it's about 70% or deeper than 55 metres. So that suggests that you know it's not going to be bottom fixed offshore wind, it's going to be floating offshore wind. And there's fourth and T, which looks after a lot of the supply chain engagement for a lot of developments down the east coast of Scotland. So I would say, yes, get as well connected as you possibly can. A lot of us are webinared out, if that's a, a phrase at the moment, but hopefully there are positive signs that there's going to be networking events by summer next year. Deep Wind and Fourth and Day and the other clusters that are emerging down in England off Energy Coast, northeast of England, there's New Anglia, there's Celtic Sea, I better mention that one with Simon being on here as well. Um, so, yes, get better connected. They are fantastic events. They set up events for supply chain engagement. They set up events for meet the buyer and networking events. It's it's all about getting to know who your potential customer is going to be. So that's either going to be the operator or it's going to be the tier one contractor, might even be the tier two contractor. So getting better connected and talking to people like Oari Catapult to see if we can help you with some of the supply chain initiatives. Perfect. And I suppose it goes the other way as well. You've got companies working um, in the renewable sector that may want to come into oil and gas because there is still an oil and gas industry out there. So. That is true, but I would say it's more the other way around. There's no doubt about that. Yes, we are seeing that. 
And um, before I go over to talk, because I've got a couple of questions for him, but certainly uh, this one's a bit more um, probably for you and Simon to look at as well. Um, from Bob Taylor um, from Bullfinger has basically asked around about the application through Crown Agency and the time it would be take. Um, is that an issue, um, especially if we're looking to repurpose or reuse some of the facilities or put existing wind farms near um, oil and gas installations? So we're probably in super late life. Does this timing cause a problem if we're needing three, four years of approval um, from a crowding agency? So is that something that we need to maybe be thinking about? I, I, absolutely. I, I'm sure Simon's got some thoughts on this as well, but that seems to be the biggest issue at the moment is actually consenting and getting through the regulations. You know, it's I think somebody said to me the other week that with Scotwind, for example, uh, I know that's not repurposing the oil and gas platforms or whatever, but with Scotwind licensing round, you know, the awards would be made in March next year. There might not be electricity produced in some of these blocks until 2028, 2029. You know, we need to uh, compress the consenting period to at least half of what it currently is. You know, there are oil and gas companies who can apply for licenses and go out and produce hydrocarbons in less time than you can actually produce electricity from offshore wind. So that needs to be addressed. There are, through the Energy Transition Alliance and Floating Wind Centre of Excellence, the Energy Transition Alliance, we're obviously working very, very closely with oil and gas industry with the OGPC. And I know that out there, there are a number of operators who are looking to electrify their uh, operations offshore in much nearer terms than what I'm talking about, you know, the, the late this decade. Um, I was even talking to an operator who will remain unnamed. They're actually looking to produce from a new field, a small field, one of the marginal pools. They're looking to produce by the end of 2022 with an FPSO, and they want the FPSO from day one of production to be utilising uh, offshore renewables. So they're looking for, I think it's a 10 megawatt uh, turbine to be close by to their platform, providing electrification for the generators, turbines, keep the lights on, etc. That is absolutely fantastic. If we can get through the consenting process and actually have a real pilot project like that come to fruition, that's just going to set off um, all the other potential projects that are out there just now. I don't know if you've got more to add to that, Simon. Um, really, just to echo what you said, Hugh, um, you know, there are um, active conversations going on with the Crown Estates, yeah. looking at ways of speeding up the uh, the leasing and licensing processes. There's also, um, you know, com uh, not, not conversations, but projects in place with statutory um, regulators as well, looking at how do we how do we improve the way we need to sort of collect data and go through environmental impact assessment. Um, how, how do we really sort of reduce that that 10 year time frame to get stuff out there and deployed? Um, so we've got a number of fairly sizable projects going on. Some of them are, are, are national projects. Um, some of them are more regional projects looking at some of the, the, the sort of local issues as well. Um, and, and I think the issue is, you know, we're, we're not going to sidestep our, um, our environmental responsibilities far from it. I think we're going to improve the way that we do these things. We're going to be able to collect the data much more quickly. Um, we're going to make it. Uh, we're going to share it much more readily, um, and that enables everyone then to move much more quickly. So, so that's the message. We're certainly on the case. There's still a lot of work to do, though. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, approvals can always be a bit of a, a challenge, but was, I'm happy to hear that people are working on that. So that's good. So I'll bring in Tom. For Tom. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up, but I think one of the ones that is always interesting in when you bring new technology into the field, it tends to be the whole cost stroke benefit analysis and new technology sometimes will come in at a higher cost, especially for upfront costs. Have you found this with your technology? Have you found that being maybe a bit of a challenge on the whole operating and capex costs challenge or just the uncertainty of taking the risk of bringing in a new technology? Yeah, I think there's on both occasions. Yes, on both both topics. Yes. So um, we come out slightly more expensive on the capex at the moment, but that's because we're just we're not at the, the economies of scale that the standard technology is at. And I think one of the, the big hurdles at the moment is trying to get a project manager working on a pipeline project today 
um, to worry about the costs of decommissioning, which will be in 30 years time, which he won't be in charge of and is not his remit. And I think it's that I think the, 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 the industry is now starting to change, but it's it's that process during the tendering is let's not just look at a, a, a capex cost which might be 15 percent more but what about if we can reduce 50 percent of the overall life cycle cost of that of that technology um so it has been a challenge and especially when your product is unproven um you know people are just very hesitant to adopt adopt it and uh, that's why i think i think i failed to mention but we have submitted a application to the offshore wind growth partnership um which hopefully will have a demonstration of our technology at a site in the uk which can hopefully alleviate some of those concerns that developers have got perfect which then takes me on to my next question which is around the integrity capability bill of the team can we say that over you know 15 20 30 years what what have you done or would you think that there may be challenges associated with long-term deployment and also can you reposition them and move them to another location yeah, so early on, early on, um, through meeting Simon at the All Catapult and Marine Eye, which is a European funded project down in Cornwall, we gained access to the University of Plymouth's Coast Lab. So we did some hydrodynamic modeling that went a long way to addressing some of the concerns of can your product remain stable in harsh conditions, which was sort of the first question. Secondly, um, we've been carrying out some material testing by SGS, um, third party consultancy, which is well known to prove that there's nothing toxic or dangerous and they should last the full life cycle of the, the project plan. And finally, in terms of relocation, we are planning. Uh, I think that's the main thing that we are. We should stress. We are planning that these could be recovered if needed. But what we're hoping is within the 20 to 30 years that they've been subsea, there should be a good scientific argument to say this is more of a benefit leaving this down than recovering it. What we're seeing is during the comparative assessment of decommissioning projects, projects are sorry, products are being recovered because they don't meet the criteria, the environmental criteria or the, the cost, the cost saving criteria. If we can have it that reef cubes show no negative impacts, uh, or our marine creep mattresses show no negative impacts, hopefully then we can we can sway that argument. Perfect, thank you. Um yes, yeah, so obviously. A lot an interesting topic when you talk about long term deployment. It's half of it you don't know how to respond. Um, back to the sort of uh, Simon and Hugh, or maybe even um, Tom. The word collaboration is used extensively in the oil and gas industry and knowledge sharing and thought leadership. Is, in your opinion, do you see that there is actually quite a lot of knowledge sharing between the renewables and the traditional oil and gas? Um, community, or do you think they are still very much seen as a standalone um, industry as part of a bigger energy sector? Yeah, I'll come in on that one first of all. Um, and I would have said maybe two years ago, not a lot of collaboration, not a lot of knowledge sharing. But in the past year, I think there's been considerable amount of knowledge sharing. And um, I know that the OGTC have set up meetings in conjunction with uh, the Wari Catapult for the integrated energy vision and those workshops have been attended from both sectors uh, uh, OGA have been there OG UK have been there OGTC the universities Bayes etc so there have been an, a tremendous amount of work done um, collaborating with the oil and gas industry and the offshore renewable industry over the past year and I think the evidence of that is that born out of that we've now got the Energy Transition Alliance with um, ORI Catapult and OGTC and the, the ultimate aim for the Energy Transition Alliance is actually to work on bigger and better projects together rather than doing isolated um, work in their own little areas, little areas, they're not little areas of course but doing doing work and uh, isolated and maybe there will be some overlap in these projects but better to build bigger and better projects rather than work in isolation simon anything to add? Uh, yeah so i mean we've i think what we've seen is that uh, it's taken a while for um both sides to understand what each has got to offer I, I think you know there, there's some subtle differences with with offshore wind you know it, it's shallower water um more oxygenated invigorated water um working conditions are different uh, you know the, the the pay structure is entirely different um and you know th there have been some hurdles to overcome and it's taken a while 
but, but there are quite a lot of success stories as well. And uh, yeah. even in the um, the tidal energy sector, um, we've seen oil and gas companies come into that sector and um, bring experience and learning. So, you know, it's really, really valuable. Um, and it's it's something we need a lot more of. And Rebecca, I would also add that your boss, your CEO, Colette Cohen, was the guest speaker at our uh, annual conference in October 2019. That's not long ago. And there were many anonymous messages that were sent through <laughs> Slido that were, why do we want to work with dirty oil and gas? And within the catapult, we've now got people dedicated working in uh, the Energy Transition Alliance and working on projects for the decarbonizing of oil and gas. Things have moved on a long, a, a huge amount in the past 12 yeah. months, I would say. Yeah, and there's been a couple of comments and questions about uh, people saying, how do I transition my career from oil and gas into um, renewables? Or how do I, as a graduate, be able to get into the renewable sector? Um, certainly, from my experience from OGTC and as part of the Energy Institute sort of chair position, to me, for anybody coming into industry, I always say look at it's the energy sector rather than an oil and yeah. gas because yeah. most of our yeah, skills absolutely. and most of our skills, and certainly, I mean, to background, I'm a mechanical engineer, stroke integrity engineer. Whether I'm looking at a platform oil and a fixed floating wind turbine to an oil and gas installation that's either producing hydrogen or still producing hydrocarbons to me it doesn't really matter because it's an engineering problem and uh, there's been recent um, discussions on that so maybe tom for you as a small startup company that's looking in both sectors do you see yourself as an oil and gas service company sme or uh renewables or are you just an engineering or potential engineering if you know you're more on the marine side but where do you where would you see yourselves as being in this picture yeah, yeah. We, would, we would describe Art Marine as an eco engineering company which services the offshore energy industry. I wouldn't define either or. Um, I would say there is some negatives about being associated with the oil and gas industry from a, a marine conservation point of view. But we are, we are under the we're under the impression that you know the oil and gas industry has brought us to the modern world and it's responsible for a lot of good things as well as some of the bad things. And it's a transition, so we need to make sure that. As an eco engineering company, we can do everything to transition from oiling dependence on oil and gas over to offshore wind. And if we can help both sides of the coin, then it's a win win for the marine environment. I would say on, on the topic of is there a lot of shared learning? I would say I'm I'm quite and we're quite niche in what we do. We, we don't have the broader scope that um you and Simon have in terms of seeing the whole supply chain. But I would definitely say from an un, from an underwater diving engineering point of view, I would say there's definitely been a lot of lessons learned. And I hear a lot of conversations saying, you know, you think you'll be able to do that, but you won't um, between between people. And I think that's from the experience of oil and gas, which offshore wind is benefiting from massively. You know, oil and gas have had to make some probably very expensive mistakes, which offshore wind have have probably had their own in a different way. But I think they've had a lot of a lot of free learning from oil and gas. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time and we're just coming up to the end of our session and I'm sure lots of people have uh, other things to go on to or uh, go back to the day job. So uh, once again, I'd like to thank Simon, Q and Tom for your presentations today. So our audience for dialing in, the um, presentations will be available online and the recording will also be available to you to come back to. If there's any other questions you have or you want to catch up with either of the presenters, um, by all means feel free to do so. Um, but just like to take this opportunity to say thank you again and uh, go on and have a, a joyful day for the rest of the time. And I will see you all later. Okay, thanks very much, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, you. Cheers, Tom. Cheers. Bye.